Is it? All right, approval of the agenda. Uh, talk. Excuse me, no. Excuse me, Mr. Peter. We do have an agenda. Do you have a presentation to the agenda? Council will notice in front of them there is um, correspondence that will be added to item number six. All right, so noted. Uh, okay, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Opposed? The motion is carried. Minutes for June the 12th. Move and second to the minutes. Rod, in the one. Any discussion on the minutes? All the vote, all in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. We have a public meeting today, uh, Bruce County Planning and Development, Regional Economic Development Coordinator, Christina Tennyson, and Economic Development Manager, Jeff Loney. Welcome. And this is the municipality's uh, community improvement plan. New and improved. Welcome, yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much. And uh, through you to the rest of the committee, I'll give a brief overview of the policy you have in front of you uh, to, and then put it back to your team uh, to allow public comment. I will note that this public meeting is required under the Planning Act as part of the process for approving a community improvement plan. So the purpose of a community improvement plan is to allow municipalities to participate in uh, downtown revitalization and financial incentive activities. Uh, this is the only way under the municipal acts that you are able to provide uh, what would normally be considered bonusing to private uh, entities. So why does the county care about this? So county governments are not permitted to have community improvement plans uh, unless they are considered a prescribed municipality under the Municipal Act. At this time, Bruce County is not a prescribed municipality. So we have been working in partnership with Northern Bruce Peninsula uh, around community improvement plans since the inception of Disperse the Bruce program, as that is our way to enable that type of program uh, in individual municipalities. A number of months ago, uh, we had the opportunity through our regional support program uh, to work with administration on your side to help uh, look at a new and improved uh, community improvement plan. Uh, and we're happy to present the final draft of this for the public meeting. So a couple of the largest changes that were included in this program, uh, I'll sort of run through them. Uh, the mapping is one of the largest changes you'll see in this uh, program. So it's a two-tier mapping uh, process that's becoming more and more used in the community improvement plan world. Uh, so what happens is the entire municipality of Northern Bruce Peninsula is designated as a community improvement plan. This means that the entire municipality has access to these programs in some way, shape, or form. The second tier to that mapping includes what we've uh, noted as a priority area, and you can see the map on the screen there. Uh, these priority areas allow the municipality to uh, restrict certain programs, and it also allows the county to restrict certain programs uh, specifically to those areas. Community improvement plans were built and were always intended to be a downtown revitalization tool, uh, but in recent years, these have been expanded. So what the priority areas allow us to do is to ensure that dollars and time and effort and impact is targeted into those priority areas while still ensuring that uh, different types of programs that provide different types of impacts are available to those across the entire municipality. And we'll talk a little bit more about those as I get into our three categories of grants that are proposed. Um, so if you scroll further into the document, you'll see that there are three distinct areas of grants. Um, the first is development incentives. So these are municipally driven, but county supported uh, grants. These include things like tax increment uh, equivalent Grants, they include things like fee reductions or surplus lands. 
So this, the, these types of grants are really targeted at large scale developments in the area, typically over, uh, over a certain value or increasing a tax assess assessment by a certain value. Why we call them municipally driven but county involved in almost all of the situations, um, the municipality would be the first point of contact for these types of things. However, uh, the county usually plays a part in each piece. When we think of property taxes or municipal fees, such as planning fees, um, or, or even with surplus lands, there, there is a role for the county to play in those. And the new grants allow both Bruce County and Northern Bruce Peninsula to participate in these if they so choose. The second category of grants are the building and property improvement incentives. Now, these incentives are municipally driven in that Northern Bruce Peninsula will be, uh, these are your programs uh, if you choose to use them. Uh, there's six different categories included in this, uh, such as signage, building restoration, or as far as we can tell, the first of its kind, uh, an incentive looking at commercial accommodation refurbishment um, that is included in those categories. Now, the lion's share of the grants that you see in here are under the Bruce County led or what we call our Spruce Diverse program. These are the county led initiatives that we administer and we fund. Um, and there's, I believe there's about 16 uh, different grants within this area. Now, these are the classic Spruce the Bruce grants that you've seen over the last number of years. That includes facades, signage, a number of others as well as an expanded uh, set of priorities um, for agriculture businesses or tourism businesses or residential and mixed use properties and for uh, accessibility improvements to our downtown. So to go back to the mapping, the whole area allows us to expand these grants into our many of our classic agriculture businesses that are not located within our downtowns as well as the tourism. The remainder of the document really gets into a number of the uh, how this project is implemented, how it potentially can work. Uh, one thing to note is unlike many policies that say, here's your policy in place, you must do this. Community improvement plans are a policy that's put in place to give you the opportunity to do things, not necessarily require you to participate in these programs. So uh, at the bottom of the uh, the bottom of the document in Schedule B, it gives you a really high overview of the various different grant programs that are available under this program. Uh, and I encourage you to take a look at those uh, if you haven't already. And just to finish our presentation, we wanna talk a little bit about what the remainder of the process looks like from a planning perspective. So this is in front of you today for a public meeting to allow yourselves and the public to have any input into that. Um, if there are changes to be made, uh, those are proposed between uh, now and approval of the bylaw. The changes, if made, do need to be circulated through the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, who has looked at this document and has no concerns about what is contained within it. Uh, if approved by bylaw in the future, this will start a uh, mandatory 20 day appeal period, like any other planning act approval. Uh, at the end of that 20 day appeal period, this will officially be in force and effect and can be utilized by both Bruce County and by uh, the Northern Bruce Peninsula. What that means on the Bruce County side is uh, there's a reserve of approximately $15,000. Uh, that are available for those four new grant categories that will be marketed immediately within Northern Bruce Peninsula. So I'm going to leave my presentation there and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, from uh, this committee or from the public should they arise. All right, thank you, Jeff. Um, so, 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 so a majority of these grants are in priority areas. I, so the priority areas are downtown core areas or? Uh, thank you. So the priority areas are your downtown cores. Um, so historically you've had 
uh, two priority areas being Tobermory and Lion's Head. And this one includes an additional one in Ferndale. Yeah. Uh, and those priority areas uh, just ensure that certain things like facade grants are targeted towards those higher density commercial areas, uh, where whereas other grants may be available in a broader sense, such as development incentives. But those priority areas really allow you to target and make the largest impacts with any funds that are that are being uh, provided to those businesses. All right, uh, and then if I go to the mapping on page 43, and that's Ferndale. So at the extreme north, the block that's there, What what is that? Is that a the the hatch or the uh, the dotted area there at the extreme north? Yeah, that one. Yeah. Is that yeah? Or... And I and I'm not sure the specific use of that property. Um, I. Right now, what you see with the dotted pattern around it essentially encompasses the commercial zoning uh, that exists within uh, Ferndale. That's typically what you'd see a priority area follow. Um, but there is an opportunity, of course, uh, at Council's will to adjust those if that's something you'd like to see. Uh, we right. could we could look up and follow up with you exactly what that, property yeah, that yeah, is. That's good. Yeah. All right. Uh, so we'll go to Council members first, then we'll go to the public. Uh, council, any questions on? I don't have any questions. Just happy to see Ferndale included in the areas because there's been interest from there, but no questions. Okay. Uh, no other members of council have questions by the look of it. So, Kathy, are there any members of the public on? Currently, there are no members of the public attending. Okay. So there's no members of the public and we have no questions here. Uh, so if we when we approve this, you say well, there's an appeal period of 20 days or what, what is it, 20? Uh, yeah, so the, the end of the public meeting will be the end of the public meeting. Uh, council would then have to consider this as a bylaw uh, in the future. Once that bylaw is approved, there's a 20 day appeal period that's put in place by the Planning Act. Um, for consideration, and I would defer to a Northern Bruce Peninsula staff around the timing of that bylaw. All right. All right. Uh, so uh, there are no members of the public, so we can close the public meeting and um, we will go to the recommendation. And the recommendation is uh, that the municipality of Northern Bruce Peninsula. Community improvement plan to be approved. Moving second, Todd and Rod. Any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Very yes. Thank you. Appreciate your uh, presentation and and your work on this as well, Jeff and Christina. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Next, we will go to delegation and uh, two delegations actually. We have the first one, Kim Clark, Environmental Data Presentation on Tourism. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Kim, you welcome, and you can give us an overview of. Uh, the short one, preferably. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure about the time, so I'm trying to make sure this is up to the page today. Oh. <laughs> okay, you, so Mr. Mayor. You, you, you can take your time. <laughs> um, the topic's not always the most exciting, so um, I prefer if y'all stay awake today. Um, my name's Kim Clark. I'm the manager of stakeholder relations at uh, RTO7, and um, uh, Peggy reached out to me and Christina to to look at some geofencing 
um, in, in particular areas around the peninsula to have a look at visitation. Who is coming for visitors? Approximately how many people are coming? How can we reach these people? What are they interested in? And how can you integrate that into, you know, tourism and, and so forth? Um, so uh, we were looking at a number of locations um, and the report that's being shown is the long one. So if you want to switch, that's totally up to you. Uh, <laughs> um, so I had a look at, um, I, sorry, I'm going to back up a minute. Um, so we at RTO7 are partners with uh, Destination Canada in their research um, program. And through that, um, we have access to uh, and Veronics Analytics, uh, which is the top market research firm in Canada. Uh, and they divide Canadians into 67 different segments based on post to code. So they bring in all these different databases. They look at the Canadian census. They look at syndicated research. And um, they try to understand Canadians and, and a little bit of more about the Canadians, all based on neighborhoods. Uh, so they also have this program that's called MobileScapes, which is a, a geofencing program. So when you don't have data, post to post, and you're, and you're looking at understanding who your visitors are, you can put an imaginary boundary around an area. So we, are, we can go up to 5 million square meters, uh, which is about the size of a shopping mall or a little bit bigger, uh, and have a look at, over a time frame, who has come in um, using anonymized permission-based data service. So essentially, if a, cell, if, if a person has their location services on their phone turned on, they, they walk through or enter into this geofence over the time frame that you have indicated, they have access to one of the apps that, that is the third party where they collect the data from, um, then a record is counted. So we looked at um, seven different areas over 2020. 21 and 2022, and we looked at the whole year. Um, so what you're going to see is a synopsis of visitation over an entire year from January 1st to December 31st. Um, so there's three columns that we that we provide to you. So one is total records. So that is the number of devices in which pinged off of the cell phone tower. So they got a data point uh, from that, and that was counted as a record. They then take this, um, you know, the number of, of cell phone pings and records and then they they normalize that to the Canadian census um, using some calculation that is far beyond my um, uh, knowledge uh, and they come out with these numbers in terms of daily visits so how many times does a device enter into one particular geofence over that time frame so if you know we were geofencing uh, Ferndale and Peggy drives through Ferndale every day for work, she might be counted 300 times as a daily visit. Whereas unique visitors are how many different devices have been captured. So it does sound very big brother, but just so that you know, we can't actually find any person. It's all in anonymized data. We are only provided with poster codes. Uh, beyond that, everything is you know very well secured. Um, so we have a, a, a summary of the visitation over the last two years. Um, in Tobamori, we looked at the Parks Canada Visitor Center. We looked at the entrance and the parking lot at Cypress Lake. Uh, we looked at the parking lots at, at Singing Sands, so we excluded the road there. Uh, we looked at the entranceway to Halfway Log Dump. We also looked at Ferndale, including the highway, so we looked at all four corners. Um, so anyone coming into that intersection is captured, uh, and we looked at um, Lion's Head as well. So um, we can compare between 2021 and 2022. I will note um, they had a, ch a change in data providers um, in July 2021. So some of the unique visitor counts are a little skewed. Um, so all of the reports are done on daily visitation. So looking at you know how many times people come. Um, within one area. If we scroll down, I just wanted to give you a visualization of approximately where people were coming from. So every color has its own, um, uh, its own uh, year and geofence. Um, I changed some shapes around, so there's a lot of dots there, but I think in general, you can kind of see a pattern of where, where people are coming from 
in the Golden Horseshoe, we can kind of see them right up the escarpment um, down the peninsula itself, but also kind of along the shoreline of Lake Huron, along the 401 corridor over to Ottawa, and we can see that a little bit over into Quebec as well, um, which is really interesting. And then kind of down the 401 corridor all the way between London, Kitchener, and um, and Windsor. So um, you have a, like a bit of a T pattern there, um, which is just for interesting. Uh, if we scroll down, I'll show you the maps of where we did. So I tried to include as much of a community or an area that might have visitors that came from. So this Tobamori, I was also able to include the tip of Big Tub Harbor as well as downtown Tobamori, including Highway 6. Um, and then Parks Canada Visitor Center, I took all the Chisinda Dick Road and then the parking lot as well as the path that walks out um, in, I think it's Head Street um, from the Parks Canada Visitor Center. Uh, so captured that as well. Um, Cypress Lake, uh, at the Cypress Lake Head of Trails, uh, the entrance into the park. So just off of Highway 6, so we weren't capturing that data again. And then anyone that might have come in from the shoreline um, into the Head of Trails that way. Singing Sands, you can see we looked at most of the parking lots on both sides. Um, as well as the beach area. Uh, halfway logged up again in from Highway 6, but also the parking lots once you kind of work down the road. Ferndale, we have all four corners. And then uh, Lion's Head, I was actually able to capture McCurdy Drive parking lot as well for first trail access as well. So the marina, um, I didn't actually capture the boats, but any of the land base, um, and then two or three blocks in the downtown. So in general, um, you have a very long document. If you are looking for something to put you to sleep, I have a read. Um, it's, uh, I, I summarize kind of the findings across all of the, of the geofence area. So mostly again, from that map, we're seeing visitation coming from the greater Toronto area, uh, Southwest Ontario, Kitchener, London, Guelph. Um, but we are seeing a lot of visitors from the Great Bruce area as well, which is, Nice to see that you know locals are coming and visiting as well. Um, there is a higher percentage of people coming from the GTA to the Parks Canada location than Tobamori, rather than just Lions Head and Ferndale, which I'm not sure it, that was not a surprise to me. Um, but I thought that was really interesting. Um, and we saw in 20 between 21 and 22 an increase of locals coming back to the national park um, and the peninsula in general. Uh, from Gray and Bruce counties. Um, there's a chart as well that shows the segmentation. So as I said, um, we use the geofencing to, to gather that data, those postcode data, so that we can put people into a segment. Um, the segments have a couple of different numbers associated one, with them. So there's 67 of them. One is the most affluent segment, and 67 is the most downscale. So it's also divided by urbanity. So what type of area do you live in? Do you live in a suburb, a fluent suburban area or a downscale? So they're rated from one to six. Um, so they're all in red. The, the kind of gold color is urban fringe. So those are like areas just kind of on the outskirts of major urban centers. Um, the, the teal color is rural. So anyone kind of in a rural part of Canada or an orange is suburban. So again, rated one to six. And they're also then divided by their life stage. So there's a youth, there are three youth segments, there are three family segments, and there's two mature segments. So where are they? Are they empty nesters? Are they, you know, just finishing school and starting out? Or, you know, are they in some st stage of family? And um, and so they all have a name. There's a picture that just that goes with them that you'll see in the other report. Um, but what I thought was really interesting was the shift in visitation between 21 and 22. We've done a number of these reports across the region, and I don't think that the shift has been as dramatic as it has here, um, which is really interesting. So, for instance, in Parks Canada, we saw um, we saw a lot of fringe and suburban in 2021. We saw the rural segments moving back into Cypress Lake, for instance. Um, and more urban segments moving back in to visit Cypress Lake, um, uh, Cypress Lake Campground. 
as opposed to um, uh, the urban fringe and suburban neighborhoods. The visitation in Ferndale and Lionshead was very consistent. So um, I, we saw like one, sh one shift in the, in, in the top five, um, but the, the segments were very consistent over the, over the other two years. So, you know, in, in Tobamore, we also saw that shift from less, uh, and, and the Parks Canada Visitor Center, less urban fringe and suburban, more rural, more urban centers as well. So that it, it was, it, it was just, a, it, it's interesting to see because that has not been the case in, in many of the other communities that we've looked at. Um, so we can see that, uh, you know, from this, this data as well, um, we can look at, you know, types of activities that they like to do and ways that they think through psychographics. So the visitors to Halfway Log Dump and Singing Sam's almost mimicked each other. Um, and I, you know, we kind of categorize this as they have a lot of confidence in big business. They have a lot of, um, they, there's a, a, a variable called consumption evangelism. So they really believe like what their friends are doing is what they want to do. Um, so, you know, I really feel like they, these are bucket list people. They, you know, Tobamori and Parks Canada is high on their radar. And, you know, everybody's doing this, so we must do this as well. Uh, these are folks that are probably going to be hard to come back. So once they check that off their list, they move on to the next one. Whereas we're seeing, you know, the shift back to more traditional visitors that have been coming to the peninsula from Southwest, um, from those, you know, very urban centers as well as um, the rural centers. And these are folks that will probably continue to come back. They have, their values are slightly different. So um, attraction to nature ranks very high with them. Confidence in small business ranks really high with them. Duty, utilitarian consumption. These are people where the message is around uh, visit responsibly will, will probably resonate quite well. Um, these are people that you probably want to have coming back. They enjoy the outdoors. They enjoy space. Um, whereas, you know, the other group love crowds and, <laughs> you know, like everyone, everyone likes something a little bit different. There's definitely an opportunity to convert them over in order to come back again and again. Um, one of the other things that they had asked us, Peggy and Christina had asked us to look for was, um, how do we reach them? And, and really, we can we can see how they consume media um, based on traditional media, newspaper, magazine, uh, television, radio. Um, digital is by far and away the largest channel that everyone uses every day. Um, social media like Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram rank very highly for them. But integrating ads into digital display, like through Google Display or AdWords, might work really well as well. These might not be messages around, hey, come visit, but it might be, hey, come visit, but make sure you plan your trip before you arrive. Um, hey, come visit, but have you thought about, you know, packing reusable water bottles or, you know, making sure that you have your garbage? Or, by the way, we have a fire van on. Think about how you're going to cook your food um, while you're here camping. So integrating that messaging in is a really good way. And these are just some efficient ways that you could potentially reach them. Um, and the other thing that was really interesting was where there were gaps and where there were opportunities to grow visitation. We hear that um, we were at Parks Canada on um, uh, Friday and, you know, there was talk about, you know, was visitation soft this year? That is something that we've heard. Um, but we could see dips in visitation through the geofencing as well. So midweek tends to be a little bit more capacity, room for capacity. So looking for opportunities to grow midweek to, to, and different times of day. So, you know, could there be an opportunity to encourage people to come for sunrise, um, stay for the night skies activities, that encourages overnight stays, that's, you know, growing economic prosperity, helping businesses as well, not just overnight accommodators, um, but also, you know, local restaurants, you know, you know maybe somebody's dropped their blanket or flashlight, and, you know, need to purchase something at the local store. So looking for opportunities to fill in some of those gaps or deliberately look for product development in times in which you have capacity would be one of my recommendations moving forward. Um, I think that Parks Canada is, uh, you know, that brand name has a lot of cloud and has a lot of, um, 
awareness throughout the throughout the nation. So leveraging the fact that you have a national park so close to you know large urban centers is really important. Um, and and you know being able to let people know that the quality of product that's available outside of the national park is as good as what you can find, or if not better, than what you can find within the national park as well. Um, look to continue to promote into the GTA in Southwest Ontario, but don't forget about the, the local regions as well. And if you're, you know, for looking at growing shoulder seasons, potentially looking at advertising within Gray Bruce counties, um, you know, down Simcoe, uh, Simcoe or, or Huron County as well, um, might be a really great opportunity to encourage people to come, you know, between the May long weekend and July 1st. Um, or, you know, September, October, um, potentially November, and then, you know, some of the things that we were hearing about, too, about growing winter visitation as well. So, you know, trying to kind of get that ball on board. Um, you know, if there is a desire for the businesses to continue to be open year-round or extend those seasons, these could be great ways for them, for you, to help them. That's it. All of that. And... All of that in 15 minutes. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Kim. Uh, questions of Kim? Right. Well, not a question, just a, a comment, I guess. It impresses me, the technology that can be used and how you can drill down and, and be really specific. I mean, it does have a bit of a big brother buzz to it, but, you know, it, it, it is fairly innocuous. And and the other thing I enjoyed and I might aspire to is to become one of these people here. I, I think I might consider myself uh, one was a backcountry boomer <laughs> or a scenic retirement or something. I'm going to aspire to get that. You, yeah, you so. put your post-it code into if you go to Enveronics. Uh, dot ca or google prism lookup you can put your post code in and it will tell you which segment you are yeah mm -hmm. uh, Kim, i've always been on the end anybody on the last term will know that i'm a strong supporter of tourism i totally get it is our number one economic driver i also feel that the municipality supports tourism but we should not be a manager of tourism so much as support our local chamber of commerce and our business areas. So will you be presenting this material, say to, uh, we've now the chamber of commerce, as I'm sure you know, is going to be representing the entire Bruce Peninsula. So I'm thinking this type of information could really be helpful for the, the chamber of commerce. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have not been asked to come and speak to the chamber yet, but I'm more than welcome to share the data. You know, with the yeah, and, and like, I mean, this isn't a great time of year. We all know how things go. So, but I do think, so, and this material then is all coming from, you find out people's postal codes and then the computer and the databases fill in everything else. So, um, you know, on the STAG committee, uh, they were uh, Parks Canada and other, we had a, a group, I wasn't a part of that one, I was something else, that were doing data collection too, and they were doing actual surveys, and I believe you were involved in, were you involved in that? Because I'm just wondering how that plays in. So it's, it was not a part of this at all then, it's two separate things. Yeah. Okay, because between that and this, there's a lot of information there. And I was surprised, again, at the parks meeting, we started to talk about, it was just a term I had never thought of uh, when talking uh, product shelf life or sustainability in terms of visitation. And it is a different way because there are those people out there, like we had the bucket listers. I've done that, been there, and now we need to focus on getting those people back and with the right message, and and so I totally get that. But I just, uh, yeah, uh, think that this information is great, and thank you, and we're all aware of the importance of it, but it could probably be important elsewhere as well. I think the other thing to understand, too, is this is one tool. This is one set of data that you can use in order to make decisions. Um, I think it's very helpful to say, okay, you, we need a starting place to move forward from, whether that's, you know, helping the chamber, or whether that's the municipality deciding that they're wanting to 
move into things or stag saying, okay, well, we need to look at, you know, visitation. What are people interested in? Where are we seeing, you know, can we understand the visitors that are coming besides surveys? Um, combining all of those sources is really important to get a really robust understanding of who the team is. Well, and that in the back hatch it because those businesses at the end of this year, they'll have a good idea what's going on. And as far as promotion and all that kind of thing, I know that's a county thing and we support the county, but we personally here and a lot of the businesses like the boat tours, all that, they even, they've done a lot of their own promotion, but they actually quit promoting in certain areas because they came under some heat for, you know, there's also the other side of that, but people just hopefully starting to realize you know what it's you know it it can be managed type of Absolutely. thing yeah so anyway thank you you're welcome yeah i just had one question about interpreting uh, some of the data there mm -hmm. see like the number of unique visitors went down like drastically like every year the total records went up um does that just mean like it's the same people visiting multiple times or what does that mean um, so the unique records is where that change in the data source came. So that's why that, I mean, I wouldn't put a lot on that number. Um, however, I think it can mean a couple of things as well. Um, if you have fewer unique visitors, but you have an increase in visitation, those people, you know, we have more, the same number of people or fewer people, but visiting more often, which is often our goal or staying longer, which is often our goal. So, you know, less, less strain on re local resources. I know this is something that we've talked about the RTO table and through, you know, tourism in general is how do you get, you know, fewer day visitors, more overnight stays. And so there is the potential that, th that you know, those fewer unique part of that could be a fewer unique, unique visitors, could be that people just are staying longer. Um, but there is there is a, a change in the data, um, and it happened in July 2022. So um, it does shift. I, I would look more closely at daily visits, which is why the report's done that way than visitors. All right. Uh, yes, go ahead, John. Can some of this data be used to help us with our self coverage? Like. Cell like some of, I know there's a lot of times I'll be in line said, and I know I don't have any data. Like that's why I wonder if some of these numbers are skewed by our cell coverage. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it would have a direct impact on that as well. That's certainly something I know. I there have been conservation areas in which they are like, can you can you um, run a geofence, and the the sample size comes back as low, and it's it precisely with cell coverage. Um, is the problem. So, yeah, I, I don't know how you would use that, but you could certainly say, you know what, we feel that, you know, using this data, and, and this is not the only product that uses geofencing data and technology. There are, you know, going to um, any of the mobile provider service providers, you know, you could, you could use the same argument as well and say, hey, by the way, we have gaps in here. Um, and I think maybe, I don't know if Swift is working on that. Still for cell phone coverage? Uh, Peggy is RTAO. <laughs> <laughs> well, I throw that up there. <laughs> yeah. And Mark. Right. Uh, yeah, I uh, definitely an issue. And as Todd mentioned, uh, I mean, I guess throughout areas, obviously, Miss Todd, but in Lion's Head, particular, like it is, it is a real issue. So. We would like to get an answer to it very quickly. So, uh, you know, I think our entire staff are working. Yeah, and, and that will affect the total records. Um, I think it has less of an impact on, on the daily visits because of that complicated algorithm in order to calculate what the estimate daily visits is. Um, but certainly, I think that that, you know, if you had better cell phone coverage, you're going to get better data. All right. Uh, can we just... I mean, we look at this information all the time and you're involved in tourism. What's your number one takeaway from all the information we have here? Um, there's a lot of people coming to the peninsula. There's a lot of trips, which is really great. Um, I did not break it down by 
month, but I certainly could. You can even look at it by weekend. You can look at it by day of the week. We, we kind of see that as a summary. Um, I think that I really like to see the shift of that sort of like those bucket list folks to more traditional um, attraction to nature as opposed to attraction to crowd. Um, because I think that really plays well to your assets and what the peninsula really stands for uh, and what the, you know, what the municipality is working towards with the sustainable tourism messaging, um, that report you did in 2018. Um, but, you know, getting the people that you want to come up here. And, and you know, I always feel that tourism is really the front door of your economic development. No one is moving to a community that they've never visited before. So if you can get them to come here, they fall in love with it. The people that are coming, I would say, in 2022 are more of your traditional visitors. And, and I, I hazard to guess if I looked at 2020 um, that the visitation would be very similar to 2020, 2021 and not yeah. 2022. Yeah. Yeah. Um, these are the people that, you know, you, the potential for them to move here to become full-time residents, you know, to open businesses is, is there. And, you know, you get better broadband and cell phone coverage and, you know, we have a lot of people that are working remotely or hybrid or, you know, um, you know they, they can work from, from anywhere now. Um, the opportunity for them to come and live here because they, you know, can relate to the community. They enjoy the, the um, amenities that are provided to them. Um, you know, they like space. They like it quieter for, you know, outside of July and August. Um, you know, I think that those are your people if you're looking to, you know, grow as colleagues. All right. Well, on behalf of council and staff, thank you, Kim. Uh, lots for us to digest. Yeah. If you have any more questions, please, you know, reach out through Peggy. I'm happy to answer. This is very high level. As much as it doesn't seem like it, there are thousands of variables that we could have looked at. And, and if you have any additional questions, we're happy to, you know, dig through the data and provide those to you. Good. Thank you. Appreciate your yeah. presentation. Thanks. <laughs> All right, our next delegation is uh, Shift Solar. And I'll let these two gentlemen introduce yourself, please. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Mayor, Deputy Mayor, members of council. Uh, my name is Bogdan Danu. This is my partner, Grant Johns, and uh, we're here to present a, a new potential project in uh, the municipality of Bruce Gray. Uh, we are Shift Solar, an independent Canadian renewable energy company, and we specialize in the development of utility scale solar PV and battery storage projects to help with grid stability and resilience for the province of Ontario. Uh, our team focuses on early stage development, including siting, land negotiations, community engagement, and permitting. Uh, we produce shovel-ready projects for experienced firms to own and operate uh, and maintain long-term. And before starting Shift Solar, our uh, team members worked on some of the largest solar and energy storage uh, facilities in North America. Our commitment at Shift Solar is to work with municipal partners and to bring the best in every project and every community. We believe that it's important to bring people together to strive for uh, the good of the planet and to complete our work with integrity and respect. So I guess the main question is, why are we here? Um, Ontario is on the brink of an energy crisis. The Independent Energy Systems Operator, the ISO, as they're known, is responsible for managing the electricity market and planning for future needs within the province. The ISO has been very open about the urgent need for new capacity and energy supply options within the province. Uh, one of the three nuclear facilities, this is the Pickering nuclear facility, is heading into retirement over the next few years, and there's going to be a significant shortfall in capacity generation. Ontario is growing population. Our healthy manufacturing and greenhouse farming sectors and the massive shift towards electrification is also driving that need up. So what are we in the province doing about this? Uh, the ISO has announced a large procurement uh, to fill the need for the capacity and generation left open from the nuclear uh, facility retirement and then the growing demand. 
the ISO has released a competitive procurement called the LT1 RFP with the goal of securing year-round capacity for new built resources. The RFP timeline uh, is currently being finalized, but it's expected that the projects will be submitted for contract this upcoming November uh, with an award between Q1 and Q2 of 2024. And then any contract that's awarded and for any project is expected to reach commercial operation for 2027. So the project that we are proposing today is called Bike Bay Solar. It's a 20 megawatt project connecting to 44 KB transmission lines. And that's sitting on approximately 96 acres of farmland. Uh, the project is close to a growing population and provides power locally uh, and is placed on cleared land in order to mitigate and minimize any additional environmental disruptions. Uh, the project is also expected to have natural visual screening to help minimize the uh, visual impacts uh, to the limited residents within that area. Next slide, please. No. Just on the, the uh, sort of map that you show there. Yes. Where is that? It is uh, Little Pike Bay Road and Highway 6 on the northwest corner, I believe. Okay. Currently farmland? Currently farmland, yes. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't tell by the map. Yeah. Um, so not only does this project provide much needed energy capacity, uh, but it also offers additional community benefits through grid modernization and greater power reliability, emission reduction, uh, short and long-term economic stimulus to the community. Uh, we often generate pollinator habitats for the for the projects that we uh, that we put in place. It helps with freshwater resource conservation. It helps to follow the land for a period of time, and then there's additional community growth support by way of uh, host benefit agreements. Next slide, please. One more, please. So our approach over the next few months will be the following. We're starting to engage with local residents, indigenous communities, special interest groups, and other interested members of the public through stakeholder engagement. We will begin the RIA process with the MECP, and this will include everything from natural heritage assessment, cultural heritage assessment, archaeological assessments, noise studies. And then we would also begin the municipal uh, permitting process. So uh, all our local permitting, our design details, safety considerations, uh, local road impacts, storm water, and what have you. Next slide, please. So based on the, the steps and timelines discussed, uh, there remains obviously a lot of work that we need to continue doing for Pike Lake Solar to become a fully permitted and built project. Shift Solar isn't asking for council to approve the project today, but rather to offer a municipal support resolution so that the project can apply for a contract under the LT1 procurement in November. If the project is awarded the contract, it's gonna undergo all of the normal permitting processes where we can discuss additional options for further uh, community benefits. Essentially, what this resolution is, is a non-binding resolution and doesn't replace any of the stringent requirements, approvals, or community engagements that we have to follow in order to produce a viable project in Northern Bruce. Um, our project is really about building utility infrastructure and grid resilience for the community in the province of Ontario. You know, there's a lot of work that remains to be done. We're not asking you to say yes to today. We're just asking you not to, not to say no so that we can continue engaging in conversation. Thank you very much. Open up to All right. questions. Uh, any questions? Uh, yes. Uh, well, obviously, this is a lot to take in for um, lay people. So your project, then you're going to create solar energy. You're going, are your plans to take that energy and uh, hook up to the existing infrastructure that's already here? Yes, that's correct. So, well, this is, we were actually at a meeting Friday where a, you know, I guess it seemed like a reasonably informed project manager who shall remain nameless talked about Parks Canada's, uh, of course, they want to go green. And the issue, according to a lot of the research, 
is not so much that there is not enough energy in this province. In fact, we give away energy for basically nothing in non-peak times. So the problem in this province and across the country is the infrastructure, the grid system is not up to delivering the amount of energy that we're already creating, say from the nuclear plants, because they're looking at, they can only um, provide, they want to have a, you know, a green energy in their vehicles and whatnot. And they're looking at uh, various, there are some ways he's looking at like that, like to store energy and non-peak like we do at the, community center with water uh, and try to mitigate that because they're afraid if they even uh, hook up their fleet to electric vehicles, it could impact the rest of the peninsula. So they're being very cautious. Right now, they're doing a lot of research, blah, blah, blah. And also, like, I mean, when we know in California, they now, they, everybody wanted an electric car. Well, now they're limited. They're limited to the time that they can even uh, charge those cars. So I guess my point is, is lack of energy, which is what you're creating, the problem? Or is it this grid system that does not have the capacity to get the energy Two people, it, and would this not exacerbate that issue for the grid on the Bruce Peninsula? Does that make any sense? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, a lot of great points in there. Um, historically, Ontario has not had an energy need. But in the next five years, the ISO, who runs the whole grid in the province, is predicting an energy need. So Pickering nuclear facilities coming offline. The federal government is making it very hard for natural gas generators to keep producing energy. So those are starting to shut down as well. Uh, so moving forward with, like you said, you know, electric vehicles and growing uh, demand, there is a need for energy in the province. At the same time, there's also a need for capacity, which for the time being, they're procuring energy storage resources, which, um, you know, shift the energy from low peak times to high peak times. So that helps, um, but they are, you know, locationally, have some capacity needs as well because of high electrical demand from you know, electric vehicles, electrification of housing, um, and you know large manufacturing centers. But to be clear, there is an energy need in the next five to ten years in the province uh, due to a lot of the generators retiring. Okay, but to me, like, okay, we've got one grid system up here right now. And I think people that are on the forefront of this have kind of over years seen <clears throat> the fact that we we've had brownouts like the peninsula's grid i mean and i know it's all over the country but i just am curious about and it's a technical thing you're creating a great deal more energy and you're putting it on in a grid on the peninsula that is already not able to handle probably what we're we want to do up here in the neck and like our our issue right now up here in a lot of places is not lack energy it's lack of the facility the grid to be able to deliver it to us so uh if you're uh, anyway that that's uh, just my point i know there's a lot more to this than i understand but i want you to to understand kind of how we might possibly look at this and would have to get a lot of information from hydro and from uh, other sources before we, I could be fully supported. Of course, and that's part of the, oh, sorry. That's part of the process as well to work with hydro one, to work with the ISO for the grid infrastructure up here. Um, there is a 44 KV line that comes with our own sound that feeds all of the Bruce Pin Linso. Uh, and that's the line we'd be connecting to. I'm sorry, what's that? Yeah, it's a 44 kilovolt line out of uh, out of Own Sound transformer station. Okay. Uh, that's the line that comes up here and feeds all the local communities. Bringing the energy production up closer to the loads, you know, helps with that grid resiliency that you're talking about and it helps local communities. Um, you know, if we're up here generating power and you're not getting it from Bruce Power, which, is, you know, feeds Own Sound then feeds up here, uh, the energy is a lot closer to the load and helps with that grid resiliency. Uh, I'm on. 
Um, have you done any comparable projects in other municipalities that allows you to look at for reference? We uh, so our, our company as a developer is is fairly new. We've been working in solar and, and energy storage for the past 15 years. So we have worked with other developers and build projects across Ontario uh, and the US. So we would be able to provide some some reference projects that we can put to the I guess the one thing you're probably going to come up against is the use of farmland for this. So um, I know it would be a willing seller buyer type thing, but uh, how are you going to sell that sort of aspect of it that we're using fine farmland for this? Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the primary reason for solar farms to be located on, on land such as this is we're not clear cutting, we're not removing trees out, right? uh, which would lead to everything from soil erosion to water issues too. So part of it is the land is suitable for these types of installations. The land is also near infrastructure, which which again is a, is a benefit, not having to uh, you know put it in the middle of a forested area and then having the complicated issues of how you service it and how you interconnect. Um, you know, the, the other benefits of these types of projects is we're, we're not stripping the land, we're not removing it, it's, it's being followed for, for a period of time and then can come back into circulation for farmland and, and for farming practices. And then there's also the emerging field of what's called agrivoltaics, which is combining both agriculture with solar. I mean, the solar system itself sits there and is passive. There are other options to be able to utilize the land under it. Uh, by way of, like I said, a pollinator habitat that can help increase the, increase the pollination of the surrounding area. Uh, you could do sheep grazing. There are certain uh, species of, uh, of flora and fauna that you're able to put in there, as well as vegetables that can still be potentially grown. Right? We, we haven't looked at all the, um, the site-specific options. This is very preliminary. The MSR request is only to give us the ability to continue discussions with the ISO by way of, you know, a, Continue dialogue. Uh, this project could take a year and a half to be fully permitted and, and analyzed, engineered, um, and you know a couple of years before it's ever constructed. So we have that time to engage with the community and, and with the, the broader government at large. At least it's not under NEC development control, although the whole peninsula is in the plan. But uh, <laughs> it could be worse. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> all right, uh, talk. Is there any plans for battery storage on this site as well? So as of right now, we are looking at solar, but we can include a battery storage component to it. Um, what we're what we've started doing with uh, IESO is what's called the deliverability test. So we basically give a project size to the to the IESO, and then over the next several months, they're going to come back and tell us how much power can be injected at this location and what the grid looks like. We we can't. We normally don't just go out and say, this is it, this is your option. It has to make sense both for the government and, and the grid and, and the community at large. So over the next couple of months, we'll know exactly what can be injected and how, and then we can determine the ultimate footprint of the project and any ancillary benefits like storage. Just one other question to follow up on Rod's comment on, it's just, it's a shame to be taking, I know you're saying that there are other uses, but this is prime farmland. Do you have a backup sites that you're looking at as well? If this, rather than this site, within northern within yeah. northern Bruce, no, this is the this is the site that that makes sense. Yeah. All right, I want to thank you for your presentation. And uh, Peggy, do you want to have any comment on this? Do you bring back a report for us, or yeah, you... we'll bring we'll bring back a report um, with a potential resolution. Uh, so we'll be working with you on that. Wonderful. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, All thank right. you so much. Thank you. Very interesting. All right. And we will go to our agenda items. And uh, number one on the agenda is from our committee and licensing coordinator, short-term accommodation bylaw amendment. Over in second for that one, Todd and Rod. Comments, questions. Uh, 
Lindsay, once again, uh, lots of amendments here and uh, clarification on things. And just on page, uh, it's 9 1. Sorry, 9 7, maybe it is. At the bottom of the page 7. So, all licenses issued by the uh, licensing issuer must be posted on a public registry. So, that's not the case anymore, or? So it is. Um, in the original bylaw, it stated that the public registry would be posted on the municipality's website and available yes. for people to see. Yes. However, um, following conversations with management, uh, we determined it would be better to have a physical copy here within the municipality where people could come and see the information pertaining to the off property owner site. On the municipality's website, there is an interactive map where they are able to view all of the licensed STAs within the municipality, including their addresses. However, the public registry has information pertaining to the property owner, which is why we didn't want that posted online. Okay. Yeah, I thought that's nice. Uh, thank you. Uh, Smokey? Yeah, just one thing, and we've discussed this before, and maybe this is fine. Um, page 7, section 8. Five is the part where we, if anyone, uh, we revoke a license that it's revoked, for, we change it to two years. But I think there was some misunderstanding in that, in that we, that was, uh, I think, Todd's suggestion in that if people were caught operating an STA without a license, that they couldn't apply for one for two years. So I'm just curious. Uh, Right now, or our previous bylaw, we uh, took away the license for one year. Do we want to increase that to two years? Because that's what this is saying here. And I'd just be a little worried that you could bankrupt a business or we might be more hesitant to revoke a license if we felt. Um, so I brought this point up before and maybe I just misunderstood and everybody wanted to go ahead with that being we revoke uh, a license that already had been issued and we for for two years at currently the ones that we've revoked we've done for one year. So I think I just want to be clear that we're doing what we want it to be doing in that. Yeah. And Lindsay, is your response, I guess, to that? Did, is that is that what you thought you heard from council or was that management that decided that was maybe a more appropriate? Uh... No, that was my interpretation after the three council meetings we oh, had okay. discussing oh, the amendments. Okay. Right. That is something that council wishes me to amend within the report. I'd be more than happy to do so. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, comments on that. Uh, I, I know we did toss that around uh, the length of, of uh, revoke, even mm -hmm. though I like the time to revoke the license. So, it uh, it is up to council. Presently, as Smokey has indicated, it is a one year. I would be afraid that if I knew two years could potentially put somebody totally out of business, I might think twice about revoking the license more. And I think we do need to be firm. I personally would prefer it to be one year, but certainly whatever this, we're here to make this decision and why there's five of us. Yeah. Um, I, I can. Yeah, maybe for now I, I can support Smokey on that. Uh, just with, with the one year, once again, I mean we're reviewing this document again within a few months, so uh, we can we can look at it again. But for now, I I, I can I can support the, the continuation of the one year. Yeah, I think I'd agree with you too. Yeah. One year is an invitation that you've done something wrong, and I guess you could always come back and say, well. You know, Another year after that, I mean, you, you just want to set the tone. As or we could even, if in our next review, say, you know, your second yes. whatever is yes. two years or whatever. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah. So maybe uh, with council's permission, we will. Uh, uh, Kathy or Lindsay, do you want a resolution to that or just the direction to kind of do the staff? I think best is probably um, a resolution on the bottom of the um, 
motion that's there. Okay. Uh, once we complete our discussion, we will look at all. All right. Uh, is there uh, are there any other comments or questions that people have regarding the, all all the amendments? And I, I have to compliment uh, our staff again on this. It's been a quite a journey we've been on in this SDA, and, and it uh, it has taken a few amendments. But I think each time we're getting uh, it a little clearer. The clarification is in the document, uh, which makes it easier for everyone. So, if anything else on item number one? So it would appear as though that that is the only amendment we have. So, Kathy, I will look to you for direction on the wording of that. Uh, sure. So, Council receives uh, CL report number twenty three hundred four entitled "Short Term Accommodation Bylaw Amendments Bylaw two hundred three forty nine as information," and that section eight five will be amended to a one year term instead of two and that we could proceed to pass the bylaw today so the mover and second on that was for talk there who was that yeah. talk yeah. so with uh yeah amend okay that amendment uh, agreeable to both the mover and seconders so we'll call the vote all in favor opposed the motion is carried we move to item number two in the agenda, which is public works, and it is a, a structural review of all our bridges and culverts. And uh, weight restrictions in some cases. So mover and seconder for that one, Todd, and uh, I'm on. Any questions on that one? Troy, do you have any comments on this one? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to um, inform council that I was hoping to have a report here for uh, council's review for the Judges Creek uh, bridge replacement uh, options. So it's a technical memo uh, with regards to the fourth concession and 10th side road uh, bridges. Yes. Um, however, we're, I'm just waiting on review from our municipal drainage engineer uh, for his comments on it. I'd like to have those before I presented the report to council. Um, but I'm hoping to have that for next council meeting. So we have some options for those two, two bridges, uh, the 10th and 10th uh, side road and the fourth concession. So hopefully we uh, um, can maybe proceed to going out to tender this year with construction this fall and on into next year with uh, permits uh, permitting. Good, yeah, thank you, Troy. Uh, any other comments? If not, uh, we'll vote on the recommendation. All in favor? Post the motion is carried. Uh, item number three is public works again, which and this is a plow truck purchase. Mover and second for this one, uh, uh, Smokey and uh, uh, any questions on this one? No questions. Call the vote. All in favor? Post the motion is carried. Number four is the public works manager report again. It's the uh, Ace Drive storm sewer. And this is connected with our development at the uh, the arena. Mover and seconder to bring this forward. Uh, Amon and Rod. Any questions or comments regarding this report? Any, yes. Well, I got a lot to learn about storm drains, obviously. And um, I think historically, Troy, there has been a wastewater issue in the past at the arena. So it is something that needs dealt with. But yeah, it's just a so basically through through the Hayes private property, we're going to uh this wastewater will be, I forget the name of that drain that's on concession four for an agree. Yeah. Storm water. No, I'm I'm aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. No, but uh no, for sure. We don't 
so it, that it is just storm water. Does first of all that drain can handle more capacity because at some point does that drain not kind of overflow back into line say it? That's a very good question. That's one part of the study. Oh, that's part of the study is to look at the hydraulic capacity right. of that drain and the catchment area to see if the drain can handle it. We believe that it can at this time. Um, and that dr that drain actually flows uh, westerly, so it doesn't come into Lion's Head. It flows uh, into Lake Huron, uh, not okay. Georgian Bay. So, okay. um, but it's it's one of our oldest drains, and so we and it does flow all through Ferndale and then uh, uh, goes into uh, Miles Bay through the Old Orleans River system. Um, oh, okay. Because yeah. because basically we're sending water up. Yeah, it's got to come down. Yeah. So you just kind of wonder, considering it is storm water, and all the storm water runs into, well, I guess like in that situation would run into Georgian Bay anyway. If there wasn't, uh, I mean, I'm just, I'm, and I guess the engineers, this is something they'll look at because yeah. there's the odd system like up by the high school. The well, I'm just, I'm just, yeah. you know, no, for sure. Me, I gotta ask a question, even though I don't know what the hell it is. But I, but it just seems like we're we're sending water up. It's got to come down. Common sense tells you if you're overloading that, it could. Anyway, that's just for sure. And they're all good questions. And and Lions Head's kind of a uh, uh, watershed divide. So yeah. part of Lions Head flows into Georgian Bay, and the and and this is on the other half. They have looked at. We we don't we have very limited storm. Uh, uh, storm management infrastructure within Lions Head. Now the county does sub have some on the uh, Bruce Road Nine or County yeah, Road Twenty Nine. Talking about yeah. yeah, but it uh, it appears that at this time there isn't the capacity at those to handle anything more. And plus of the gradient that is a different watershed. So I, I mean they're going to be looking at all okay. the options. Okay. Yeah, so we're not just looking at we're going through private property and it's yep. going to the fern drain. There's going to be um, and, and before that they can before that they can really finalize the design they have to look at all the, the capacities of, of everything and then make a recommendation so. thank you yeah. all right uh are there any other comments uh, regarding item number four if not we will call a vote uh, all in favor <coughs> opposed motion is carried Item number five is the chief building official. And this is an agreement on Walter Sherman Drive. Mover and second for that one. Uh, Rod and Amon. Any questions on this? One? All the vote, all in favor. Oh, do you have a question? Oh, all the vote, all in favor. Opposed? Carried. Item number six is a no demand for service site plan control agreement. And uh, this one is on Green Cedar Drive. We were a second to bring that forward along. And uh, Todd, any questions on this one? Call the vote. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Item number seven is the same property and uh, just lifting a holding zone on that one. Uh, mover and second for that, uh, Todd and Smokey. Any comments or questions on this? All the vote, all in favor. Opposed? Motion is carried. Parks and Rec. Uh, Parks and Rec facilities manager, results of our uh, RFP results for the Tobamori Lions Head playground equipment. All or uh, move on second for this, right? And uh, talk. any questions on this one? Uh, Smokey, yeah, okay. Um, well, at D, I guess at least Milton, Peggy, and I will recall that a group represented by Mindy Scott, um, approached council last term about the need for the new playground equipment at the school bill park in Tobermory. 
Uh, they had all they'd already done some research on it. They had some suggestions as to particular models. Uh, were willing to do fundraising, and they even had contractors willing to donate their time and equipment for installation. At that time, Peggy explained that uh, all playgrounds in the municipality had to be inspected. There were new regulations, and uh, and due to this, uh, that we would wait until um, this was finalized, and then they could be involved in in the process. So when I saw the report with the recommendations to award a contract to supply and install equipment, I reached out to ask if the group was happy with, uh, satisfied, et cetera. Um, it was complete news to them. Um, they, apparently they had no part of the process despite emails that they would be uh, involved in some way. And uh, the comment to me just was, well, anything is better than what we have, but that's not the point. And so uh, I guess I just have to reiterate that that's not the point. Um, and um, it's just that I would think that a group like that would be a very uh, helpful in determining playability is this what their children require i mean i have no i appreciate the get her done but uh i just i feel disappointed and uh find it hard to explain to them why we are at a point of approving this and they know nothing about it all right um... Mark, you want yep, to? Absolutely. Not through you, Mr. Mayor, to Council. Um, Mindy Scott, I believe, I, I did meet with her at this office uh, when we, before we started the RFP process, explained what was involved and certainly welcomed and invited the volunteer community support for the project to assist in different aspects of the project, not necessarily the entire assembly and construction. Uh, the playgrounds do have to be uh, installed by the playground company uh, and certified as as built to meet the standards that are required. Uh, but certainly there was no turning down of offers of assistance or help. Uh, the designs that they had looked at were shared with me both by Amon and, and, and Mindy and I explained that those are great. But that's just from one company and our procurement mm -hmm. process would allow requires us to to put it out uh, for others to bid to provide other designs uh so we did that um and we can still uh work with the community and their assistance in helping with parts of the project so part of part of that would be uh, helping uh, remove uh, the existing playground equipment prepping the site prior to the new equipment going in, and then potentially with the backfill of the uh, wood chip fiber material into the playground, but any of the heavy equipment portion, uh, direct installation, so that the playground equipment is installed to the code, that's best done by the playground. Yeah, and that's fine, Mark. I guess my question is, were they made aware? Were they shown any of the uh, options? Were they part of the decision-making process where this is what was chosen? Uh, like I got the impression and I'm, I'm just the middle person here. I reached out and said, here's what, you know, is this what you got? You know, it was just that they said they had email, they had not gotten responses, but we're, I'm not trying to cause any issue here. Uh, and they are happy that, you know, something is happening. I'm just curious, like, were they any part of the decision making that this was chosen or? It's not that any one person chose a specific design. The RFP process is set up so that the playground companies submit a design uh, based on information we can give them in the RFP. So the information that was given in the RFP was of a marine or beach theme type playground, which I had discussed with Mindy. Um, so that was the best way we could describe because there's a million and one options 
for playground design, and we can't necessarily ask a, a playground uh, company to give us unlimited number of designs to pick from because every design is a different price point. So we, we have a budget for the project. So we asked for them to design a, pro, uh, a playground for each location that gave us the most elements of play meeting all the standards for playground build. So they gave us their best design that we could get the most elements for the money that we had available to do the project. So, Yeah, I guess just the playability thing to me, um, like that would have been something I would have not, I guess that was built into it in some way, but maybe not a more of a practical matter with, uh, you know, people that are dealing with kids all the time right. now and whatnot. So uh, yeah, just, uh, that's it's, my comment. It, this is a common challenge with building any playgrounds because when a community looks at the catalog and they see all the designs and then when they realize what the price points are for those designs you soon realize you'd have to increase your budget significantly to achieve the ultimate playground so well, yeah that's fine and they probably at some point are intelligent you know and and understand that i just feel that at some uh and I will get more information on it. I just wish that we weren't at this point without more contact uh, and, you know, um, input. But just to comment. There was certainly no intent to offend anybody or. No, I, I, under, I understand that. I just feel that we're a small community. Yep. It is different here. And lots of times if we reach out and explain something ahead of time, we get less issues later. I get less issues later. And they understand why this has happened, why it's done this way, rather than uh, trying to explain something later when there's already uh, something's already happened. Because as we know, it is, you know, when people, when they basically came to us quite a long time ago, regarding the issue. I just, uh, I said that I would mention this and I have done so. All right. uh, well, yeah, I'm certainly happy to see it go ahead. And then just a bit of a history lesson here. I was there when we built that original one in Tobermory mm -hmm. and it was built with the aid of the five members of council. And I think our budget was eighteen thousand bucks, and we had a hard time getting that eighteen thousand dollars. So, and it's it yeah. has been a good it was a good choice for the time for sure. It's it's been well used, well used. All right. Uh, so I guess, in, uh, Mark, uh, just in defense of your uh, recommendation here, and. And I, I hear what Smokey is saying, but I think at some point we do have to look at what we, I think to get the biggest, the most bang for our buck, uh, is probably, and I know nothing about playground equipment, but I, I do know one thing about, it. they are very expensive. And, uh, but to get the most out of the equipment that we are, are uh, that we have before us here today, uh, I think that's, that's good. And I'm sure uh, that uh, I'm sure the majority of people will be happy with it. Well, any, uh, Amon, do you have any comments on this one? No. No. Um, all right. We will call a vote. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? I'm going to abstain just because of uh, yep. the issue currently, and I know that comes across as uh, and it's not that I oppose playground equipment anywhere. <laughs> no, that's good. But at this point, I will abstain. Okay. Uh, the motion to carry. We will go to item number nine, municipal law enforcement. Uh, so this is just simply some uh, new appointments, different people on the uh, contract that we have. Uh, Move for a second to bring that forward to Todd and uh, Amon. Anything on this number nine? Any questions? Number nine? All of all, all in favor? 
both motion carried. <clears throat> Number ten is uh, request for NEC comment, and uh, this is a uh, Bruce Trail Conservancy application on behalf of the owner. And down in Rush Cove. So, move around a second to bring that forward. Come on, and Rush. Any questions on this one? Comments? All the vote, all in favor? Opposed? The motion is carried. Number 11 is the Integrity Commissioner Report. And this is an extension of the uh, integrity commissioner that we already have until 26. So mover and second to bring this forward. Todd and Mark. Questions on 11. Any comments, questions on 11? Call the vote, all in favor. Opposed, the motion is carried. Uh, number 12 is the municipal accommodation tax clarification uh, enforcement date of the bylaw. So, number 12. So, this one we heard some feedback from our uh, establishment, and uh, as a result, we have uh, the new date that's on this recommendation here is January 1st, 2024. Move our second to bring it forward. I'm on and Rod. Uh, uh, yeah, I just, um, just wanted to express some more feedback um, back from the Chamber of Commerce. Um, so we had our committee meeting this past Thursday, which unfortunately was too late to um, submit anything for the agenda, but they would like um, us to consider postponing um, this discussion and adoption until um, the next council meeting um, so that they can have the opportunity to submit a formal delegation to council and um, express um, some of their opinions and concerns um, around the bylaw and its implementation and its extent. Um, okay, so there- uh, You just want like a formal opportunity to, um, you know, speak with all of council. Um, Cause I know they've shared some of their concerns before, but not in like a public formal capacity. So they just want to have that opportunity. Um, so they can bring forth the delegation uh, at the next council meeting to talk about it. Uh, the second there, what's your thought on that? I think, well, we found from the meeting, Mel, there's there was a lack of um, communication and information on both sides. There were many people in that room that really didn't, I'm sure maybe they did, and I just got the wrong impression, really understand that this is that how this operated and they weren't really, um, Paying this, it wasn't a tax. It wasn't a tax, but uh, and on the other hand, there was a lack of um, understanding of how they need to run their business on our side. In that, you know, a lot of people had already paid, and it would be a real burden on them to try to bring this in for July first. So I think even if it's just an opportunity for both sides to ask questions, we, you know present why we feel we've why we passed this the bylaw remains and they can tell us uh, you know we sh well actually at one point they call it it's crazy <laughs> but anyway, uh i just think the back and forth information and you know would be good and then we all understand each other and there won't be um i th i just think it's be a healthier relationship and so I agree with Amon. Certainly, there's no. This isn't coming into effect according to this till January the first. So an opportunity to listen to them. We're going to learn something. Hopefully, they're going to learn something. I I am all for that. All right. Uh, if you have any comments, so uh, uh, we can we can go to. So Amon, what do you suggest? Can you just give me some idea till until next council meeting or. Uh, exactly. Yeah, they just um, want to be a part of the discussion regarding um, uh, the implementation of this. So, okay. And uh, they just 
um, their meeting was too late to meet this deadline. So I, I, I would look for a deferral. On, uh, and I'd look to both the mover and seconder of the move for a deferral uh, on this. And Kathy, when's our next? Uh, next council meeting is uh, July 10th. I'm just going to have to check because right now we have four between a public meeting and two other delegations and a planning meeting. Oh, okay. So that may have to we may have to be at the next meeting. We can discuss it following the meeting here and see what works best. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, with the thought of bringing it back as quickly as we can, I guess, so that we there's some so that the businesses know what our thoughts are on this. Uh, all right. So that'll be deferral on uh, on item twelve. So we'll call a vote on deferral. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, two thousand. Uh, no, number thirteen is two thousand twenty-four. Two thousand twenty-four. All right. Just want to make sure I had that right. Council meeting schedule for two thousand and twenty-four, and it is outlined there. We were in second to bring it forward. Uh, Smokey and Todd. Any concerns or questions about those days? <laughs> yeah. We're, we're, we're off against the day. We can't discuss that. <laughs> I'll call the vote. All the paper. Post. Okay. Item number 14 is proposed amendment. Then this is our clerk to our fees and charges bylaw. Uh, move on second for a fee and charges. Uh, Brock and uh, uh, So I think we can do Brock and Brock. I just, I think it's a spelling mistake. It's $60 per house. Yeah, that'd be good to get that cleaned up. Yeah. Yeah, if you just on that foundation fee. No, not that the care and maintenance, sir. It's the 250 minimum to a maximum of 450. So how does that work again? So under the care and maintenance with the Bereavement Authority of Ontario, uh, it's 40% of the foundation fee. Okay. So we had a minimum fee to a maximum fee. And um, I checked these with our current cemetery manager um, who will be doing these. And this is why with the change um, from him taking on cemetery manager and ground maintenance, um, we had to adjust the fees here because of the price um, of him doing it and the price of concrete these days. So we okay. adjust them. Yes. Any other questions on item 14? All about all in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Uh, move to other business. Does anyone have other business? No. Yeah. And this maybe is an um, other business, but I'm just wondering our our relationship with the county is that we provide uh, the water for the ambulance station. And there's been an issue there, we all know. And part of it is that there's just old toilets. Now, maybe Mark, this is something. Oh, Mark's gone. Uh, scare him off. But anyway, <laughs> unintentionally. Uh, there, I mean, it's a county building. They need to replace that. Uh, we still have an issue. And, the, and they need to... Um, if they replace the toilets in the ambulance station to newer ones that wouldn't keep running, um, there would be a bit of one less thing to worry about as far as running out of water this summer. My understanding is it's it's just a question of replacing the toilets. And if the county could do that, I think that would be uh, something that would be helpful. Oh, okay, my other staff here. Any other business? 
no one else has any of it. Uh, we'll go to correspondence and uh, we'll just put down the list here of rank. I'll uh, get a move and check and we'll move forward to uh, the information ones in particular. And we may be providing direction. So that's uh, the information ones. Move and check with that. The rod and the bond. So Rick Dyer's a uh, good news story here for Ray Bruce, uh, MP, MPP. Uh, Lisa Itterman regarding our fireworks. Uh, did you have a chance to have a look at that, uh, uh, Jack, or Fire Chief uh, Jack? Do uh, you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah. Uh, I did get a chance to look at that. And, uh... That's probably better. Yeah, I did have a chance to uh, look at that letter as well as I spoke to uh, Ms. Kitterman about her concerns. Oh, okay. You you have. Um, her concerns are in the Eagle Road East area. Yes. Uh, with the area itself and uh, mostly can noise pollution. So you can't hear? Yeah, yeah, it is on. It is on. Yeah, it is. Maybe speak more into it. Uh, um, and there's uh, concerns with noise pollution as well as uh, the fireworks themselves in that area. Currently, there are two um, there's fireworks. Still, still having trouble hearing me, Jack. Currently, there's two fireworks permits that are um, open in that area that have been approved. But as of right now, no fireworks are being permitted because of the restricted fire zone. Uh, that's been implemented by the province and the municipal burning ban. So the people that have those permits initiated, like they're informed that, do they? Yes. Yeah, they have to call in to activate their permit. If they try to call in, they'll be told that they cannot have fireworks. Okay. Yes. Yes. All right. Just one. Any any other comments on that? Uh, So next on the agenda is the NCPO and that's the awards gala. And once again, our staff, well, not individuals this time, it is a, uh, a team effort on this one, a project team. And this was for uh, the Danby Awards given out annually by AMCTO to acknowledge the municipality's dedication to public service. Excellent, excellence and for introducing innovative ways to deliver service to their community. And this was uh, the modernization of our digital records management system. So uh, our clerk, Kathy Addison, was down at that, as along with our CIO, Peggy, uh, was down at this uh, event. Where, where was it, uh, Peggy? Sorry. Niagara Falls, okay. So they were at this event to accept the award, and uh, I guess on behalf of council, certainly uh, appreciate their efforts in this. Yes, and it seems like yeah. every meeting we are recognizing uh, I'm sure individuals. Kara has to do with this too. Oh, Kara, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Or Kara, right. And then, but then we had our new website launched as well, mm -hmm. so we've had a chance now to look at that website, and so that that's another team effort as well, and uh, we should be bringing them all out here to recognize them actually, and maybe we we can do this and, and just so that we know who all work on the project, and in both cases, so that would be be good. So next meeting, we, next meeting we can we can we, we can recognize all like all of our staff that were involved in this uh, these both these projects, and I guess feedback. The sense of Peggy sent some information out, or Kara sent some information out regarding her new website, Peggy, and uh, give us a bit of an update on that. Yeah, so um, with our with the launch of our new website, we did have a, uh, let me just uh, pull that up. We had a very, um, I would say a very successful first week. Uh, we're actually 
um, up with our daily visitors plus um, uh, some new members. Uh, a lot of the um, the community calendar seems to be very popular, which is great. Uh, we highly recommend that anybody that would like to see what's going on in the community, uh, either populate the calendar, you're allowed, to, uh, members of the public are allowed to do that now. Um, and then also the council uh, section is also very successful, plus the employment opportunities. So those were some very, uh, some very great uh, items and we've heard nothing but uh, good responses. Kathy, do you have any comment on your event? Or... No, I guess I just wanted to put in the um, essay on behalf of this municipality because we are rural, we are remote, and we have to do things a little unique and different. So with a team effort, um, we were able to win this award in Niagara Falls. So Great. it certainly was a team. Thanks. Great effort. Thank you. We'll move to item number four. And that is uh, the women of Ontario say no. And this, uh, they are looking for a resolution. I believe so. Does anyone? What is council thought on this one? They're looking for support. I can't say I know enough about what they're proposed. Like, we we do have. Um, the integrity commissioner rules. Uh, yeah, I I'm not sure what else they're looking for beyond what. Yeah, I guess some incidents that happened. Uh, yes. Um, so the uh, women who are volunteer that say no pro progress uh, group is essentially um, wanting to bring uh, forward the. Um, the legislative amendments that were brought forward uh, to the code of conduct, it was voted down. Uh, essentially what it was, was to strengthen the wording regarding uh, violence and sexual harassment um, to staff members, um, which would, by council members, which essentially could uh, remove a council member from a, um, a either committee or the council table itself. So um, they're asking that uh, they um, they're asking for um, municipal council support to um, bring it back to the yeah. table. Uh, Rob, did you support that? You said yeah, yes, yes. I'm on support. Yeah. Any further comments? Um, uh, all in favor? Opposed? The motion is carried. And municipality West Gray is item number five. Um, that is the sharing of infrastructure, basically. Um, the resolution brought forward by Cleve, and they supported that resolution. Um, but should anybody have any thoughts? One of those common sense things that yes, it I, I'd support it. Yeah, yeah, I'll support for. Uh, uh, call the vote. All in favor? Opposed? The motion is carried. So we'll go back to our information items, which is one, two, and three. Excuse me, Mayor McKeever. Yes. We have the addendum there, number six for Ooh, Pike Bay. Yes, sorry about that. Yes. Yeah. Item number six was the new one we added to the agenda. And that was they want they want the uh, municipal support. So uh, municipal uh, support for the Pike Bay Association, Smokey and uh, uh, so call a vote. All in favor? Opposed? The motion is carried. And we'll go to one, two, and three for information. So we'll call a vote on that. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. And we'll go to bylaw. Uh, so we have a rope weight restriction bylaw. Close the municipal combination tax bylaw. Asset retirement obligations. And left the holding zone at Cedar Drive. And the other one is a confirmatory bylaw for our meeting today. So moving a second for bylaws. Um, Todd and sorry, where are we? We're going to number two. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Tommy, that is only for that's we're you deferred that. So we'll have to pull it. 
We have to include five there too, Mary McKeever. Thank you. All right. One, three, four, and five. All in favor? Yes, pass. Third time to charm. Uh, third time to uh, Next thing we're doing is for the second of the proposal. Thanks very much.